Howdy Explorers, I'm Joe. Today, to start the celebration of spooky season, I thought we'd take a look at some of the ghost stories of Maryland and see what, if any, historical provenance there is, or if these are just tall tales designed to scare kids and adults alike. Why start in September? Well, <laughs> if you've been a follower for a while, then you know my upload schedule is sort of uh, erratic, we'll say. So, with all that said, today we're going to be starting with the legend of Big Liz. Quick shout out to all my Dorchester County subscribers who've gone out to De Corsi Bridge. You guys know I had to start with an Eastern Shore story. Before and during the Civil War, many plantation owners and farmers had southern sympathies in Dorchester County. Confederate agents likely had caches of money and supplies hidden in and around these farms to protect them from discovery and seizure by feds. At the same time, the feds recruited free blacks and some slaves to spy on these movements and report back. It was kind of a tug of war at the time. Dorchester County, and many other rural counties both in Maryland and outside of Maryland, was a hotbed of activity for both sides of the conflict. That's the nature of Maryland being a border state and the Eastern Shore in particular being a rural area thereof. Uh, Dorchester County is famously where Harriet Tubman was born um, in a plantation in Bucktown. Uh, that's near Cambridge today. Um, so Dorchester County has been long at the front of, of different racial strife, both in the antebellum during the war and in the postbellum period, as I'm sure we'll cover on the channel in a, a later date. With all of that established, though, now we can talk about Big Liz and her role in all of this in the 40s. Due to the hardy nature of the works that she was forced to do, Liz grew exceptionally strong and large. It was said that she is able to carry two pigs under her arms and still carry a whole bushel of tobacco. Due to her robustness, she was often tasked to perform intense physical tasks that would have been impossible to others. Liz's abilities were an inspiration to the slaves around her and a source of ire and discontent for the brutal overseers that were assigned to break her. No matter what task she was given, Liz got it done. Over time, Liz's strength became extremely valuable to the plantation master. He began to task her directly, and as a result, she began to learn the secrets of the plantation, as well as the other plantations around that the master would communicate with. One day, under the guise of doing some work as a laborer on the plantation, a man spoke to Liz and offered her an opportunity. Would Liz like to help the Union and hurt the slave-owning South where it hurt the most? How could she refuse an opportunity like that? So, from that point on, everything the master said and every kernel of information she was able to glean was relayed to this man, who then relayed it to the higher federal authorities. It didn't take long for the information that Liz provided to have an effect. All over Dorchester County, caches started getting raided by federal agents. At first, the plantation master wondered how the federal agents could be so effective. After all, the Yankees weren't good at much of anything, judging by how the war was going. Then, one day, he realized no raids had happened anywhere near his plantation. Hmm. Almost like somebody didn't want to draw suspicion. As that idea took hold in his mind, he considered all of those close enough to him to have access to the information that would lead to those caches being raided. Could it have been his wife? His kids? Going out for tea and talking to each other? No. His overseers? No, no, no. They weren't. They wouldn't have done it. Then who? Who? Hmm. After a short time, he had his suspicions, and he devised a most terrible vengeance. The day started like every other day for Liz and every other slave. Too early, with an inhumane amount to do. She was already so tired as the master had a seemingly endless amount of things he wanted her to do. His latest task had been relatively simple, thankfully. Get a shovel. Come with me. As the master led the way through the woods, he began muttering loudly enough so that she could hear. Dang, Federals, I need to move caches. Nah, I won't find this money. Liz tried to commit this to memory for her informant. As they came to a clearing near the swamp, Liz took note of a single sapling just starting to poke its way through the ground. Dig here, and bury this fast, her master ordered. Liz began to, and completed the hole rapidly. She reached over to grab the bag to place in the hole, 
and as her eyes locked with her master's, she noticed a murderous look overtake his features. Then, before she could react, the handle of an axe seemed to appear, and in seconds it was over. Liz lay decapitated, eyes open, seeing nothing, next to her powerful torso, struck down and left exposed to rot. The master, in his cruelty, did not deem her worthy of even a shallow grave, still fuming that one of his slaves could have gotten the better of him. While Liz's body decomposed, her soul couldn't find rest. Her unwatching eyes saw the progress of the future and saw the establishment of what we know as De Courcy Bridge. Now, on cool nights when the fog rolls off the swamp, Liz, in all her restlessness, calls for those parked on De Courcy Bridge to join her. If you want to call her, honk three times, flash your headlights twice, and turn off your car. Liz will come for you, and she'll be holding her head, eyes glowing with the pain and anger of her fate. If you do want to follow her, though, be warned. You may never find yourself back on the bridge in our reality again. All of those who follow Liz never come back. So, that is the legend of Big Liz as it was told to me many years ago. I did add a little bit of detail to make it more of a narrative for the sake of storytelling, but hey, I mean, that's a tall tale and a local legend, right? So, to get back to the historical side of the channel, the question is, did Big, Li did Big Liz actually exist? And yes, and also no. Um, and none of the research I've done have I been able to find, um, you know, a slave named Elizabeth near Greenbrier in the 1840s. Um, I checked through the Dorchester County archives, through the Maryland State archives, um, and then did some general Googling and, and things of that nature. But there's nobody by that name that was ever recorded. The thing is, though, records from that time, and especially for uh, enslaved people, are exceptionally terrible. Um, there are so many people and so many stories that we will never really get to hear because history won't remember them. Um, and not to get on my soapbox, but that's kind of what this channel was originally. Um, and so the question is, was she real? Probably not. But for every story that we didn't get to hear, we get to hear Big Liz's story. And so to extrapolate that, there were people alive that were fighting for their freedom through subterfuge and whatever means necessary. Those names and stories are lost to history, but we have Liz that all of these people live through. Um, and so the story is exceptional in that manner because it's plausible enough to have maybe been real. Um, with the details that I've added, different things that I've heard from, from other stories um, of people in a similar situation to Big Liz, it's it's this fight for freedom against all odds. Um, and even though Liz's story didn't really uh, end all that nicely, and certainly many others didn't end that nicely, it's a story that captures that, that feeling. Um, and so I don't really think it matters if it's true or not. Um, Personally, uh, when I was a teenager, it was fun to go out to the bridge and pretend maybe maybe it would happen, maybe it wouldn't. You know, you'd just be hanging out with your friends doing something goofy. And then if you add detail to the story, it, it kind of speaks to, to what, what these people went through. And so I think the value of Big Liz is, is more in that. It's more in the fun of a spooky story and also recognizing that um, enslaved people uh, had a, a terrible, terrible fate and did everything they could to get out of it. Um, so that's the video. Hope everybody uh, enjoyed it. Hope we like this format. There will be hopefully a video a week um, going through a different ghost story or, or haunted scenario, something supernatural in Maryland with a little bit of history. Um, next up should be Patty Cannon, uh, which I've wanted to cover on the channel for a long time. So look forward to that. So let me know in the comments if you guys have ever been out to DeCourcy Bridge um, or any other uh, stories that you'd like to see told on the channel. Even if it's not in Maryland, that's okay. I'll make an exception for for the spirit of Halloween. Um, and then last but not least, I mentioned two of my sources. The third one is ChesapeakeGhost.com. Um, it's a blog. Uh, has a, a lot of interesting things, specifically from the Eastern Shore, but also in Baltimore and other areas. So definitely give that a look if you're looking for something spooky. 
all right i'm gonna end these videos the same way every time happy halloween take care guys see you on the next one